So the secret's out. I am a Republican. Uh, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands to see just how alone I am in the room. Uh, but I suspect that I am most likely in the minority here. And that's OK. Uh, but I don't want that to always be the case. And so I sort of have two audiences for this talk. One is my fellow Republicans and conservatives, wherever they may be, here in this room, out on the wonderful internet, watching this streaming, watching this later. But my audience is also those folks who may not be conservative, but may have heard the lessons of Stacy's talk earlier at this session about the need for the civic tech world to grow its ranks, to grow the number of people who are engaged in what they're doing, to expand it, to get more people focused on it. I think there's a huge opportunity for folks to reach out to conservatives who may not yet have this sort of stuff on their radar and get them engaged as well. So I want to start off with this. How many of you know what this is? <laughs> For those of you who are on the younger edge of the millennial generation, you may have just been born in the mid-90s when this was a thing, but this is called SimCity 2000. It is probably one of the greatest computer games ever, uh, and it was my first introduction to how government works. I learned pretty early on a number of things. If you raise taxes too high, everybody leaves your city, but if your taxes are too low, then you don't have enough money to pay for the schools and the fire departments and the police departments. Um, I learned that you can can never have enough education funding. No one will ever be happy with the amount of money you put in education. And if you cut transportation funding even a dollar, it's total panic meltdown and your roads literally begin to disappear off of your screen. <laughs> so I learned an awful lot from playing this game, but I also learned that there is this one really important metric for success. Your job approval. <laughs> I may have become a pollster, someone who does surveys of voters trying to study what people are thinking, in large part because I learned very on that this was an important metric of success and is one that I was going to track for the rest of my career. But what's so great about SimCity is not just that you get to track whether or not your people love you, but you get to track all kinds of neat stuff about your city. You get to track not just the city size, but you can look at a heat map of pollution or crime in your town. You get to look at things like what percentage of your town has power and water? How's education going? What are the health statistics about your town? You can figure out what's going wrong and try to come up with a good solution to fix it so that you can get that job approval back up. You have an incredible ability to look at data about your town. This is pretty neat. And what I think SimCity taught me early on was one, that it's good to have information about what's going on in your city if you want to run it well, but that government does matter. That whether I had high or low taxes, there were still things that needed to get done. Government still needed to exist. And so even though I wound up becoming a Republican, I'm certainly not a secret anarchist. But if you watched my party's presidential debates and you were playing a drinking game where you drank every time somebody said the word big government, <laughs> you might not be here today. <laughs> uh, big government is uh, our favorite boogeyman on the right. We don't like big government. Fighting big government. Big government sucks. It's so terrible. We love to talk about how bad big government is. And the reason why a lot of folks think we should let not like big government is, well, government doesn't work very well. Government does stuff pretty badly, right? Well, the reason why I'm a conservative and why I'm skeptical of big government isn't because I'm an anarchist. It's not because I want to hand everything over to the corporations and go jump in my money pit at the end of the day. The reason why I tend to be skeptical a little bit of, of government is because I believe in accountability, and I think sometimes the government's not accountable in the way certain things in the private sector are. There's a really interesting sort of theory about what makes an institution get better. A uh, political scientist named Albert Hirschman, and there are two factors that he identifies as things that help an institution, an organization get better. The first is exit. Can you leave something? Do I have a choice? So I don't have a choice to exit the DMV. I need to get my driver's license. There's not another DMV next door that I can choose from. There's not another IRS I can call if I'm having trouble with my taxes. There's just one. So I don't really have exit. Whereas in the private sector, you do have exit. If Uber's not working out for me, I can try Lyft. If one restaurant's not great, I can try another. But the other thing, in addition to exit, is the ability to have a voice. 
that in the private sector nowadays, we have an incredible amount of ability to have a voice. Not only can I switch from Uber to Lyft, but I can rate the individual driver. Not only can I say, I'm not gonna go to restaurant A, I'm gonna go to restaurant B, but I can rate restaurant A online. I can give it one star and be really mean, or I can give it five stars if I really love it. Um, I can know exactly how that avocado slicer I'm gonna buy on Amazon is gonna work before I do it. This is the sort of thing we have come to expect from the way we run our lives and the way we engage with the private sector. So why shouldn't we then expect this from our government? If I, as a conservative, extol the virtues of the private sector, I think the private sector is so great because people have choices, they have the ability to leave, and they have the ability to make their voice heard, then what if we could start importing all of that to how our government works? When we say we want the government to run more like the private sector, it doesn't mean we want someone somewhere to make a whole bunch of money. It means we want the incentives aligned properly so that people's voices can be heard in the same way that they decide, you know what, I think I don't want to go to this restaurant, I want to go to that restaurant, they, and therefore restaurants feel compelled to get better. Can we make that more a part of how government works? Can we take these tools and make them more a part of how we govern our country? Because when we don't have them, things like this happen. I don't know how many of you encountered this story, but this was a story about how there is literally a cave in Pennsylvania where there are physical paper records being kept about veterans' retirement information. It is a cave under the ground with paper. Nothing is digitized. And there's really no pressure to make it digitized. This is the sort of thing that would never really be acceptable in the private sector. If this was happening, a company would feel pressure from its board, its shareholders, it would feel pressure to change and update and move on. But unfortunately, because there's no exit, and because unfortunately there's sometimes no voice in government, stuff like this can happen. This whole exit and voice contrast was also uh, came up in a, an interesting piece at the Upshot blog uh, at the New York Times recently uh, about the, the controversy around TSA and the long lines at airports. Because again, there, we don't have the ability to choose, well, I'm not going to fly out of this airport with TSA, I'm going to fly out of that airport with TSA. We don't really have good information to make a decision like that, but we also don't necessarily have voice. I guess we can tweet at the TSA, but how do we do things more effectively? And so the, the call to action at the end of this op-ed from these economists was that this isn't partisan, that instead we should have good data about wait times at airports so that we can learn which airports do a good job of processing a lot of passengers, which airports are doing a bad job, so that people can know that airport has longer wait times than that and they can make informed decisions as a result. And the op-ed also points to the FAA as being a good example of an organization that does release a lot of data so that when I, as a customer, am choosing between airline A and airline B, flight A and flight B, I can see what percentage of the time those flights are on time. It's data that's being given to me as a consumer, but by a government agency that, gosh, I, we really ought to have some kind of government agency making sure planes don't hit each other, uh, that, that I think is, is a good example of how data put in the hands of the people by the government can help make things work more effectively. Another story about wait times that came up recently was the story about the wait times at the VA, and there was quite a bit of controversy over the Secretary of Veterans Affairs saying, you know, comparing wait times to get care at the Veterans Administration hospitals uh, to wait times at a theme park. So this is the confrontation ride at Universal Studios Orlando. This was my first job. My very first job in high school. I grew up in Orlando, Florida, and I worked as a ride and show attendant on the confrontation ride. I had to dress up like a New York City police officer. I had to drive the tram. I had to do really terrible acting, tell everybody to get on the tram and pull down the lap bars. And I will tell you what, we kept a lot of data at that job. We kept a lot of information about how long our wait time was. We kept a lot of information about how many passengers we were getting through the ride. How many, what was the average number of passengers we would fit onto one of those trams? Were we doing that as efficiently as we could? And then how many times could we get the tram to go around in the course of an hour? How many times could we actually get the ride to complete? We would track all of these things, and if we had a slow day, we would get asked by our supervisor what happened. If we had a great day, we'd try to learn what did we do that day that was great. In the private sector, we knew that we had to do this right or people were gonna take their money and they were gonna go to Disney. They were gonna go to another ride. They were gonna go somewhere else. And so we knew keeping data was gonna help us get better. So this again, this is something about the private sector that conservatives ought to love. We love the private sector. Why can't we take these sorts of things and import them into our government? 
Because we, when we think of big government, we think this is what we're fighting against, right? These big buildings that we know exactly what we're talking about. But I think this big versus little government binary debate removes the question of, well, why don't we just take the government we have and make it work a little better? Instead of always saying we've just got to shrink it or get rid of it, what if we actually started making it work a little more effectively? I think this big versus little debate is completely outdated. I do a lot of focus groups in my job, and as was mentioned, I study young voters. And I did a focus group in San Diego, California, where I asked some young voters, do you think taxes are too high? And they said, yeah, I think generally, maybe not on the wealthy, but pretty much. I said, do you think the government spends too much? We have too much debt. And they said, oh gosh, we do. We spend way too much money. I'm so concerned about the national debt. And then I said, do you think that government is too big? And they all just kind of stared at me like they didn't understand the question. And then one of the respondents, and I think she was joking, said, big government, do you mean like the buildings? <laughs> that this concept of what big government is is something that like conservatives can close their eyes, they see this building and they go, ah, oh, that's what big government is. But for an awful lot of people, particularly younger voters, they don't view it as this big versus little binary. They would just maybe like their government to work a little bit more like Uber, like Amazon, like the services that they're use, used to using in their private lives. They're used to working with companies that are creative, they're used to engaging with companies that are accountable, where their voice can be heard, and they want more of that in their government. Now, conservatives and the tech world don't always have a super close relationship. This is me uh, at Facebook's campus a few weeks ago being wooed, not to be mad at them anymore. Uh, they put an Oculus on me, and it certainly did the trick. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, you know, conservatives and, and, and the tech world, I think there's so much over lap there that I, I think uh, conservatives don't necessarily understand or want to engage with, and I think for the tech world, because there are a lot of issues where most people in the tech world and some prominent folks in conservative land definitely don't agree, there's a sense that there's no conversation there to be had, and I think nothing could be further from the truth. Take a look at this polling data from the Pew Research Center. Asked a bunch of questions about how they, people think the government works. 42% uh, of Republicans who are politically engaged are angry with the federal government. 65% say the federal government does a poor job running programs. 84% government is doing too many things better left to businesses and individuals. That's why I'm here with this message today about how civic tech actually takes in many ways the things that we like about the private sector and brings them into government. Government is almost always wasteful and inefficient, 84%. Government needs major reform, 86%. So why can't the civic tech world's message to conservatives be, yeah, government does need major reform. Yeah, sometimes it does do things that are wasteful and inefficient. Yeah, sometimes it doesn't do a great job of running programs. And we have the answer. We can fix it. Rather than just getting rid of it, abolish this department, slash this program, what if we made them work a little better? Because I think the problem is that too often conservatives say, say, say that we are fighting big government. But all we really want is accountable government. And I think a lot of the work that folks in this room are doing right now is exactly what we need to get to that goal. So it's not about partisanship, but for those of you who are trying to figure out how to explain exactly what it is you're doing and why it matters to someone who might be on the other side of the aisle and to who, with whom you might not know how to have that conversation, just realize that ultimately, even if conservatives are talking about big versus little government, what we really want is accountable government. And there's a lot of folks in this room doing stuff that can help us achieve that goal. Thank you.